Honourable Senators, I rise before you to lend my support to Bill S-211, an act to enact the Modern Slavery Act and to amend the Customs Tariff, sponsored by Senator Maville Duchesne. Though the bill's prime objective is to eliminate forced and child labour from Canada and involvement in the global supply chain, the bill calls on us to reflect on another kind of slavery we know to be in place in Canadian society, namely human trafficking, in other words, organized sexual exploitation and child sex abuse. Before I joined the Senate, I was commissioned by Public Safety Canada to research and co-author a paper on the trafficking of Indigenous women and girls. The study was based on 76 interviews we completed with subject matter experts, many of whom were survivors of sexual exploitation. <clears throat> they had been trafficked as children, teens, and adults. We respectfully called these women the PhDs of the topic because of their extensive lived experience. We also interviewed law enforcement agencies and organizations and individuals who were frontline workers. The purpose of the study was to shed light on the mechanisms and ways in which the trafficking of Indigenous women and girls for the purpose of sexual exploitation occurred. I learned many things during this process, and I would like to share a few anecdotes on the importance and necessity of passing this bill. Public Safety Canada defines human trafficking as the recruitment, transportation, harboring, and or exercising control, direction, or influence over the movements of a person in order to exploit that person, typically through sexual exploitation or forced labor. Human trafficking, sexual exploitation, survival sex, and sex work are distinct experiences with a range of impacts that require targeted supports and policy responses. The difference in these terms are rooted in the act of giving consent. It's essential to recognize that consent does not necessarily suggest an informed choice. As one expert remarked, it is rare that Aboriginal girls or women of colour experience sex work. They are often trafficked for power and control and coerced into prostitution for their survival needs. The element of consent in the trafficking definition <clears throat> is usually misunderstood, thus conflating sexual exploitation with sex work. Trafficking comprises the use of threat, force, deception, fraud, abduction, misuse of authority and giving payment to coerce consent for the purpose of exploitation. A subject matter also added that even the use of this language, the, hum, the term human trafficking in place of sexual exploitation may have the impact of marginalization since it forces Indigenous women into a framework that does not take into account the historical events and policies that have shaped their lives. The Native Women's Association of Canada has noted that First Nations, Métis and Inuit women make up 4% of the Canadian female population, but roughly 50% of trafficking victims. 25% of all trafficked people are under the age of 18. The women and girls are the prime targets of trafficking. Trans women, men and boys are also subjects. <clears throat> we discovered that gangs are involved in the trafficking of Indigenous women and girls. They range from less sophisticated street gangs or groups of co-offenders who may constitute a criminal type organization to fairly sophisticated ones in the form of escort services, massage parlors or exotic dancers. Women are generally recruited by various methods including coercion through love and domestic violence. In other words, women are not even aware at times that they are being trafficked because they are in love with their trafficker. We also discover that can be a young girl who does the recruiting, somebody who appears as a mirror image of her target, who initiates the selling of the dream of a better and more prosperous lifestyle. Peers are especially persuasive. Typically this translates into a pyramid scheme of sorts wherein recruiters take the share of the earnings for the girls they have recruited. High schools and even playgrounds are places where traffickers will entice and recruit Indigenous girls. Girls as young as grade 6 or 7. Sometimes they meet them on the way to school, luring them with gifts and promises of a better life. Social media is also used to entice young Indigenous girls, especially in rural communities, where the charm of the big city or the promise of a good job is easier to use as a deceptive ploy. Some pimps or boyfriends will invite young girls to come to the city to party under the guise of a romantic wooing. Imagine the dangers that besets a young girl who leaves a remote area 
and goes south for a medical treatment. She arrives in a foreign, fast-moving environment and a young man or woman steps out of the van and offers her a ride or to go to a party. She accepts and soon she's surrounded by strangers. She's offered drugs, takes them. Maybe she's plowed with alcohol. Later that night, she's photographed in compromising positions. She is then threatened with the photos that will be sent to her family or posted on social media. <clears throat> she's then coerced into selling herself to pay back the money that was spent on her in a never-ending cycle. But at some point, she may realize she doesn't want to leave because her life was never better. These horrific socioeconomic determinants of sexual exploitation and trafficking results from factors such as the legacy of physical and sexual abuse experienced in the residential school system, dispossession of identity and culture via the Indian Act, violence, racism, and the marginalization of Indigenous women resulting in low self-esteem, poverty, and invulnerability to being trafficked. Addictions and mental health issues among those who are trafficked are widespread and often the result of being either introduced to drugs as a method of control or a way to escape the harsh realities of being trafficked or exploited. The stories of the women are haunting and I will never forget them. One of the subject matters shared how she'd been exposed to violence through her own pimp who over the years had burned her feet, broken her nose and beaten her with an untwisted coat hanger, broke her fingers and even went so far as jumping on her pregnant abdomen to cause a miscarriage. They are forced into working while they were sick and forced to dress in a bikini with a fur coat outdoors in freezing cold weather. The women and girls are moved through relatively well-known trafficking corridors and circuits. The trafficking of First Nations, Métis and Inuit women and of non-Indigenous women too is generally triangular. For example, east to west, Halifax to Truro, Halifax to Montreal, to Toronto. There is movement on boats too. In an example of the economics of supply and demand, we find the increase of demand for sexual services matches the increase of men to the shipbuilding areas. More than one of the subject matter experts I interviewed explained what a Pocahontas party was. The men dress up as the proverbial John Smith and the indigenous women are paraded and dressed up in Pocahontas outfits. The experts said that these parties were commonly held on boats in the Niagara region on the Great Lakes. In the north, air travel is the primary means of long distance transportation, so trafficked Inuit women follow major transportation hubs. For instance, the Eastern Arctic airline flies women to Ottawa, while the Western Arctic airline flies women to Edmonton and Winnipeg. Airports were identified as the point of recruitment in big cities like Montreal, especially for the Inuit. It is common for a trafficker to know someone in the community who acts as an informant when a girl plans to move to the city. Upon their arrival at the airport, traffickers lure the girls under the pretext of providing a place to stay or giving them access to resources. A frontline support agency in the north clarified, people don't leave the north to work the streets but may go south to Ottawa to attend a doctor's appointment. One woman breached the rules of the house in Ottawa and ended up on the street when kicked out. She was stranded with no money and no support system. And in this case, she was extremely vulnerable. In the northern prairie regions, the circuits are from the Paw, Flin Flon, and Selkirk to Winnipeg. Prince Albert is a gateway to northern Saskatchewan. Saskatoon is also a gateway to the west via Edmonton to Vancouver. Law enforcement participants cited Edmonton to Mississauga to Niagara Falls as a pipeline of movement. And another subject matter explained that expert explained that the downtown east side of Vancouver is full of Saskatchewan, indigenous people, and they die there. There's another very poignant story I wish to share with you. It is of a woman named Sharon Akus. When we interviewed Sharon, she said to me, I will allow you to interview me on the one condition that whenever you talk about me, you say my name aloud. Sharon Akus. I promised I would. Here is her story. Her parents were residential school survivors. Sharon was sexually abused at home as a very young child. Sexual abuse became normalized for Sharon at a very young age. Her father wanted a better life for the family and moved them to the city. But once in the city, Sharon soon learned that it became easier for her to earn money from the normalized behavior of being sexually abused while she worked the streets. She was on the streets for 30 years. 
through pregnancies and child apprehensions. And here's what Sharon said to me. Each and every time we refer to individuals who are involved in the sex trade as hookers, prostitutes, ho, we dispirit them. No individual comes into this world as a hooker or a prostitute. We all come into this world with spirit. Each and every interaction and every individual we come into contact with either contributes to involvement in the sex trade or involvement in a productive lifestyle. When a woman is abused by her relative or whomever, it does something to a woman's spirit. The spirit leaves when they're being abused and it comes back when it's over. And those words will haunt me forever. When Sharon was about to have another child apprehended, something happened and she said no more. And she reached out, she got help and she began a journey to health and freedom from the life on the streets. Sharon went back to school and worked her way through high school, through university, and Sharon earned a PhD. She now teaches and she counsels women on the street. And I have said her name every time I speak of trafficking issues over the years. And each time I do, I like to think that one more woman reaches out and finds Sharon, and Sharon helps him get off the street. She has written a book about her life called An Arrow Through My Heart. Interestingly enough, all of the subject matter experts that we interviewed for this study, all were residential school survivors or had parents that attended residential school. I now want to turn my attention to the 34 interviews we conducted with law enforcement agencies across Canada. And I must share that I gained a new respect after this study. I realized how difficult it is from their perspective to put in place measures that can stop trafficking. They identified human trafficking as a ghost crime, adding, there are thousands of victims, but people don't report this type of crime. This fact alone is an important point that supports the reporting requirements in the Modern Slavery Act, Bill S-211. All of the police organizations interviewed highlighted the difficulties of collecting data and reporting on cases related to the Indigenous status of victims. Traditionally, victims are reluctant to disclose trafficking, as they may not self-identify as victims. Many consider their traffickers to be boyfriends, in addition, many Indigenous women are reluctant to disclose to law enforcement the fact that they are Indigenous. Historically, there has been little trust between Indigenous communities and the police, and this reluctance is rooted in a history of mistreatment by police, and the legacy of the fear continues. Several police agencies serving areas where there are major infrastructure or natural resource projects reported that they've seen an increase in the sex trade and of human trafficking when major projects such as mining, oil extraction, and shipbuilding get underway. And this fact speaks to the importance of passing S-209 as well, Senator McCallum's bill. An Ontario police officer commented to me, the average age of recruitment of human trafficking victims is 14 to 16 years old. That doesn't mean we'll find them at all at those ages. We we'll may find them at 18 to 20, but it's really a juvenile problem. Last year, 33% of sex, sex workers identified were juveniles. An officer from a western province noted, as police were standing on the tracks and can see it coming for many years. Many of the people we interviewed spoke of a Canadian crisis, evidenced by the sheer numbers of Indigenous women and girls who are subjected to normalized sexual and physical violence as children. Sometimes as part of the child welfare system, they are trafficked, incarcerated, sterilized, and go missing or are murdered. But thanks to the commitment of the many heroes who work on these issues, leaders like Diane Redsky, the executive director of Mama Wichita, who in Winnipeg, who has worked on the provincial strategy in Manitoba, and Valerie Pelche and Trish Bapti, who helps women exit, and Sherry Smiley, a former anti-violence worker now pursuing a PhD, who all appeared on a panel today on sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. They are working tirelessly to eradicate exploitations of all kinds against Indigenous women and girls by focusing on the root causes, a systemic and coordinated approach that lists and heeds the perspectives of the women that have been trafficked, that includes financial solutions to exit. Senator Mabil Deschamps' bill will bring transparency to the supply chains of multinationals who, along with making profits for their shareholders, have a civic responsibility to Canadians and the citizens of each individual country they do business in. 
Bill S211 aims to make the seemingly invisible visible. This type of innovative legislation must extend to other sectors of society where the plight of vulnerable populations is often overlooked and their stories are too often silenced. Megwitch, Marcy, and Gosi, thank you.